energy rich regions have been going through boom and bust cycles for a long time. But the latest plunge in coal production has been particularly swift and deep, affecting not only workers in the industry, but entire communities. I'm Lee Patterson with Inside Energy. We collaborated with the public media program, The Allegheny Front in Pennsylvania, to take an in-depth look at the collapse of coal. We begin in Wyoming, where hundreds of coal miners recently lost their jobs in the first major layoffs to hit the region. Gail Japp's horses have helped her through hard times, like when she was getting divorced. When you got a bad day, you come out and they just, I mean, they just make life worth going on. Recently, things have been tough again. Jap was one of the nearly 500 Wyoming coal miners laid off recently. And to pay her mortgage, she'll have to sell a lot of her things, including her beloved horses. So I have no choice. I mean, I just, I've got to downsize and, and there's a lot of stuff I'm going to have to sell. Jap worked for Peabody Energy for over a decade, mostly driving massive haul trucks. After cutting jobs, including hers in March, the coal giant declared bankruptcy in April. See, they, they were so fun. Them things were just awesome. She misses it and is worried about getting a new job. Yeah, I can't leave Gillette, and which is really going to make it hard for me to find something because my dad's 90 years old. I don't know. It's been devastating. Fossil fuels employ around 10% of Wyoming's private sector workforce. So an energy bust hits towns like Gillette particularly hard because this region is rich in all three, coal, oil, and gas. Gillette even calls itself the energy capital of the nation. But over the past year, unemployment claims in the county have more than doubled. Businesses are closing, homes are up for sale, rail traffic is way down, and people, all of the sudden, are in need. You all in the same household? No. A line formed at this church-run food bank before the doors even opened. Do you have children? I do. Oh, well, this should help out a little bit. Yes. Volunteers served 110 families that day. Dennis Reeder is the pastor at Project I-61 Ministries. After the layoffs at the coal mines, Reeder has been expecting to see those workers at the food bank. But he says they've actually been serving a lot of people in other industries, such as oil field workers and hotel employees who have already been out of work for months. In three months from today, those uh, people that are living off savings or they've exhausted all their means of financial help or, or other community things, now they really, really need it. So it's kind of like we're, we're a last resort. For decades, Gillette has had a strong economy and a low unemployment rate fueled by energy dollars and plentiful, well-paying jobs. The average coal miner in Wyoming makes around $83,000 a year. The average American worker makes just over half that. We can't play pony right now. Stacy Moeller has been mining coal since her 20s. And she says for her, it's more than just a job. You know, you work at something for a long time and it becomes such a part of you. Losing that identity is scary. And Moeller isn't sure anything could replace coal mining in Gillette. I mean, there just isn't anything for them to go to that's comparable. What would it be? And how do we start that? And how do we get there? Everywhere you go in Gillette, people are thinking about these kinds of questions, like Valerie Debeau and Barbie Hayes, the manager and owner of a local bar. Jake's Tavern is a working man's bar. It's like a neighborhood bar. It's a neighborhood. Like, it's a, like a cheers. cheers. Yeah. Recently, they've cut back on hours and stopped offering insurance to their employees. We don't want to have to lay off anybody, so we just continue on. Try to cut our costs as much as we can. Debo and Hayes have seen slowdowns before, having lived in Gillette for almost 40 years. So when I asked what they're hoping for, they went back to what's always happened. Another boom. Yeah. We want Absolutely. that boom. Yeah. But another coal boom is unlikely anytime soon. Coal production this year is expected to drop 16%, which could mean more trouble for towns like Gillette all across the country. While these massive layoffs are relatively new for Wyoming, Appalachia has been losing jobs for years. Still, residents in western Pennsylvania say the latest downturn is like nothing they've ever seen before. Reed Frazier of the Allegheny Front reports from Greene County. 
Hey, good job. Party was on. 18-year-old Caitlin Allison is the reigning bituminous coal queen of Pennsylvania. It's part of a tradition that goes back some 50 years. But Allison says the responsibilities that accompany the title have become even more important this year. I've just been trying to bring awareness to the situation in our area that is causing many families to have trials and tribulations trying to provide for their families. Allison has some firsthand experience with those trials and tribulations. Three years ago, her father lost his job at the Greene County coal-fired power plant when it was shut down. She, like many in this region, is very worried about the future. If I want to stay in this town and there's no coal mine or there's nothing to keep our town thriving, that there's no reason for me to stay here. Greene County in western Pennsylvania has been one of the biggest coal-producing regions in the country. The industry provided good-paying jobs with generous benefits to some 4,000 coal miners at its peak. But all of that is quickly coming to an end. Last fall, the local Emerald Mine declared bankruptcy and announced it was shutting down. It was one of five mines in the area to close recently. Those closures put over 200 miners out of work. That's so coming out of the mine. Bob Wilson and Dave Hathaway were two of those miners. It was, I mean, great, great place to work. It was fun. It's like family. I'd work a lot of weekends and holidays and basically anything that let me work, so made over 100000 my last year, you know. Since February, the two have been pounding the pavement looking for work with very little luck. There ain't really nothing around here, so what are you going to do? They've tried to remain positive, even forming a group to help fellow miners get information about training for new jobs. But their spirits are beginning to wane. For the man of the house not to have a job is pretty disheartening. I mean, it's a, it's a hit to my ego. And it's not just miners who are out of work. For every coal mining job in Greene County that is lost, five other related jobs are also affected. We're uh, just about finished with a project that's 1,200 feet deep. Tom Crooks is vice president of the R.G. Johnson Company, which builds mine shafts and elevators. He gave us a tour of his brand new 30,000 square foot facility. It was planned during the booming economy three years ago when the company had 165 employees working around the clock seven days a week. Now they can only employ 25 workers. Yeah, it's emotional for us. We love being coal people and that's being taken away. Crooks says he's seen downturns before, but he's never seen anything like this. We didn't do anything wrong here. That's what's so astounding to us. We're still the cheapest power source, even with natural gas being inexpensive. But Jay Apt, who directs Carnegie Mellon's Electricity Industry Center, says the downturn is all a normal part of an energy economy. If you look at a country like England, we haven't mined coal in England since the mid-1980s. There's a lot of coal still left under the ground in England, but we're not mining it because they found North Sea oil. And that disrupted the whole energy industry there. Here, in this country, we found natural gas. It's disrupted the energy industry here. And Pennsylvania has been among the leading states in fracking for natural gas, which is replacing coal as a source of electricity. Still, the changes it's causing are extremely painful. Robbie Matisic is the Economic Development Director for Greene County. This is a tough pill to swallow, that um, something that has sustained the economy here for so long, has sustained so many families, and it's been a way of life, is possibly not going to be there. So what did happen to coal? How did the industry get to the point where companies are declaring bankruptcy and demand is in steady decline? These are polarizing questions with plenty of political finger pointing. Many Republicans, including presidential candidate Donald Trump, have repeatedly attacked President Obama for devastating the U.S. coal industry.
have these ridiculous rules and regulations that make it impossible for you to compete. But the forces behind Cole's slump began long before President Obama even took office. Tax credits for wind and solar, regulations requiring power plants to reduce emissions, market forces, and then there's President Obama's clean power plan. A plan two years in the making and the single most important step America has ever taken in the fight against global climate change. It's the first ever federal rule to limit carbon emissions from existing coal-fired power plants. The rule is now on hold while legal challenges against it are resolved, but it's all contributed to a strong feeling in coal communities that the president is out to destroy them. Any regulation that affects coal will hurt people who are involved with coal, and that's the first target. According to the Energy Information Administration, U.S. coal production in 2015 was down 10 percent from the year before. Regulations do play a role, but that's not the whole story. It's more of a perfect storm of factors. Like low natural gas prices, coal analyst James Stevenson says we cannot overstate the importance of this. Natural gas has been a, a real game changer in North America. Here in the U.S., Technology uh, allowed extraction of natural gas uh, in new ways that, that have turned out to be very cheap. That can outcompete a lot of coal. With the glut of so much more natural gas on the market, its price has come way down. The price of renewables is coming down too. But that's not all. Recently, several coal giants have declared bankruptcy, in part because of bad debt. So what happened was in 2010, 2011, People think back that far, they remember China was growing 10, 11 percent, Southeast Asia was growing leaps and bounds. Growth over there means buildings. And buildings require steel. So in the early 2000s, coal companies invested heavily in metallurgical coal, which is used to make steel. And that growth never occurred. So now they have a lot of debt that they have to pay down, and the markets are soft. In the end, when it comes to demand for coal and the companies that supply it, utilities are the ones looking at all of these market factors and then making decisions about the future. This is pretty much where the coal comes into our facility. Black Hills Energy is a utility serving Wyoming, Colorado, and a handful of Midwestern states. It owns this coal-fired power plant and the coal mine next door. When the power plant was built back in 2010, around 40 percent of the cost, $100 million, was spent on pollution controls housed in this massive structure shown here. But this is not the company's model going forward. We would like to build new coal-fired generation. We believe in coal, but under current rules, no, we would not be cost-effective for our customers. In 2011, over half of Black Hill's total capacity came from coal. Today, it's down to around 35 percent. Over the past few years, the company has shut four coal-fired power plants. Even we are switching to natural gas as a utility, despite the fact that we have that low-cost fuel essentially in our backyard. And it's not just Black Hills customers who are getting more electricity from natural gas. Nationwide, 2016 is projected to be the first year that natural gas-fired generation surpasses coal. Despite changes in our power mix and regulatory uncertainty, some power plants are installing new equipment to comply with environmental regulations. These rules require power plants to limit their emissions of dangerous pollutants. So how does that retrofit happen? Reed Frazier went to Homer City, Pennsylvania to find out. The Homer City generating station rises like a cathedral out of a valley just east of Pittsburgh. You can see its smokestacks and hourglass-shaped cooling towers from miles around. As is happening at many coal plants around the country, workers at Homer City are busy installing pollution controls to comply with new clean air rules from the EPA. These controls will take out sulfur and other harmful pollution, like mercury. Total cost? $750 million. A lot of people just think, ooh, you can, you can just sort of snap these things on to the back end of you know, some existing facility and that's it. Um, this is a massive, massive construction project. Like any huge construction project, right, you know, it's expensive. Two million homes. That's how many buildings Homer City can power when it's running at full capacity. Electricity streams out of the plant north to New York State and into the mid-Atlantic grid that powers Pittsburgh, Philadelphia, and Chicago. 
The new equipment is needed because of clean air rules the Obama administration imposed on the coal industry. These include the cross-state air pollution rule and the mercury and air toxic standards. When these rules came out around four years ago, Shapiro said Homer City, which opened in 1969, faced a crossroads. You know, well, you didn't have much choice. You basically, you either put on the pollution controls or you stop running. And at that time in 2011, right, basically the decision was that it made more economic sense that, you know, you actually invest in the plant as opposed to shutting down. The Supreme Court sent the rule back to the EPA to rework, but it's still the law of the land. Around the country, dozens of coal plants representing three-quarters of the nation's coal-fired power fleet are adding mercury controls to comply by this year's deadline. Around 200 older plants have shut down in recent years, though cheap natural gas is also to blame for these closures. A shutdown Homer City plant is what many people in the area are afraid of. Power plant c closes, it will cripple this area. Not only Center Township and Homer City Borough, but as well as the county. Homer City's seal includes a depiction of the power plant. It's literally painted on the town's cop cars. Sitting in the town's municipal building, a mile from the plant, Nymix says he's old enough to remember when the power plant was built in the 1960s. And uh, I remember when I was a little kid that we would wake up and there would be orange or black uh, particles all over our cars and our, and, and our uh, houses, and that doesn't happen anymore. Over the decades, the plant has continued to add pollution controls as the EPA has steadily increased its emissions requirements. But in recent years, Homer City has still been ranked as one of the largest emitters of sulfur dioxide in the country. That'll change with the new pollution devices. Overall, environmentalists say the new rules should improve air quality around the country. Well, there, there will certainly be an improvement, no doubt about it. Um, uh, I think there will still be areas where where the air can be at times unsafe to breathe. And so, you know, it, it's, a, it's a process of, of uh, being vigilant and making sure that the regulations are enforced. What does it take to keep 100,000 tons of pollution out of the air every year? The answer comes up six flights of stairs at Homer City. Each boiler at the plant, where coal is burned to create electricity, now has a whole building dedicated to cleaning up its coal exhaust. The new system basically removes 90% of the pollution that would have escaped out of the plant's smokestacks. But despite all these improvements, the plant is still struggling to compete financially against natural gas. As demand for coal shrinks and the health of the industry deteriorates, it's getting harder to pay for coal mine cleanup. In the West, there are concerns about funding future cleanup at mines that are still operating. In Appalachia, people are dealing with dirty, abandoned mine sites from decades ago. It's a nice day for a walk in the woods, but this is not a hiking trail. This site is known as the Fredericktown Refuse Pile. Some people call it the Black Dog Hollow Refuse Pile as well. A coal refuse pile made up of rocks and low quality coal. And then the reject material from was just trammed and then conveyed up the hill and dumped on this giant pile and left. That was over 70 years ago. The coal mine nearby changed hands as companies went bankrupt. Now, the pile's a hazard. There are hundreds of sites like this one in Pennsylvania, and there are tens of thousands of abandoned mine sites scattered across the country. They can't catch on fire. This particular pile is not burning that we are aware of, uh, but many of these do catch on fire. Like this one in Einan, Pennsylvania, that was put out in 2015. Cavazza once fell into a burning pile himself while investigating a fire years ago. It was very scary because <laughs> uh, it was like walking onto a trap door and having somebody pull the string because you just, just dropped. And I was in over my head uh, in a hole and it was smoke all around me. Not all problems with abandoned mine sites are straight out of an action movie, but they're still significant. When it rains, these coal refuse piles can discharge some nasty stuff. This so-called acid mine drainage can contaminate streams and sometimes even impact the local water supply. Homeowners like the ones who live around this pile deal with pipes and sewers that get clogged with runoff. So it's a big maintenance issue for the township. 
Kavaza, as the head of the bureau that deals directly with abandoned mine remediation, wants these piles cleaned up. But it's expensive, and the money to do the cleanup is tight. A lot of it comes from something called the Abandoned Mine Land Fund, or AML. The fund is generated by the active mining industry, and uh, the country is beginning to move away from coal as a primary source for electricity generation. And with coal production at its lowest level in 30 years, there's simply less money coming in. In Pennsylvania alone, AML funding has dropped by over 25 percent since 2013. In Wyoming, the worry is about future cleanup costs. How thick is that seam right there? 35 feet thick. These pits are huge and are generally filled in as mining operations progress. The area that you see mining right here will look like this in approximately two years. This green grassy area right next to the mine was a mine itself just a few years ago. It has since been filled in and reseeded as part of the complicated, lengthy cleanup process known as reclamation. For part of the leasing process, before any mining begins, mines are required to have a reclamation plan. And something called reclamation bonding. That's a guarantee, an insurance, that we will accomplish the reclamation that's outlined as part of that lease. So basically, a payment to make sure future mine cleanup gets done. Regulations in some states allow coal producers to self-bond, which means a company promises to pay for cleanup based on its financial strength. The problem comes when those companies become financially shaky, and the cleanup money gets tied up in bankruptcy court. In Wyoming, we're talking about hundreds of millions of dollars. All of course before digital. Pat Sweeney has been working on Western land issues for decades and even lobbied for the 1977 federal law that regulates coal mine cleanup. He puts this problem into perspective. Remember, the circumstances were so different then, too, because you had uh, viable companies that at the time no one ever thought there might be uh, a companies going bankrupt. No one thought, you know, in some respects that um, there would be a change in energy policy. Cloud Peak Energy, the coal company that took us on the reclamation tour, is not one of the companies in bankruptcy and is moving away from the practice of self-bonding. But with some of the largest coal companies in the country working out reclamation details during and after bankruptcy, the future of cleanup is unclear. The future of coal communities is uncertain too. How will these regions deal with job losses and declining revenue? Reed Frazier takes us back to Greene County, Pennsylvania. Yeah. We're gonna need to put it in a bigger box. This is not gonna Ted and Jessica Fink have decided there's no future for them anymore in Waynesburg, Pennsylvania. So they're packing up their home to move to Tennessee. It's amazing what you find when you uh, start going through stuff. Ted was laid off from the nearby Emerald Mine in November, and since then, their family of four has been struggling to survive financially. It's definitely scary entering that chapter with two kids mm. and bills, mm. um, you know, because when you live on a, a coal miner's mm -hmm. <laughs> a coal miner's salary, shall we say, um, and you accrue bills according to that, mm. and then all of a sudden that isn't there, but your bills still are. Ted has found it impossible to find another job in coal country. It was, it was very tough. I filled out many applications, and it just kept coming up dry. You remember that job that, that you applied for, that truck driving job? Former miner Dave Searock was luckier. He got a job as a peer counselor for laid-off miners at CareerLink, a job training program. The downside? Taking the position meant a $70,000 a year pay cut. The transition was actually really hard. I mean, obviously the biggest thing was the money. And, and it, what effect it had on not only my life, but my kids. Pennsylvania received $2 million from the Obama administration this year to retrain displaced coal workers. It was part of a $35 million initiative to encourage economic and workforce development in hard-hit coal communities. And that's as it should be, says Carnegie Mellon's Jay Apt. Government should recognize that it's in the interest of a better GDP in the country to make education and training part of our culture. That's one of the things that makes America great, is that our workforce is adaptable. Sea Rock says paying for schooling is a good idea, 
But if unemployed workers don't get help with living expenses, the program won't work. Guys want to go to school, but they can't because they can't afford to pay their bills as they're going to school. Most schools are, are eight hours a day, you know, so you're going to be going eight to ten hours a day with your drive time. So we're, finding time to work a second job is kind of hard. When workers are able to take advantage of the training, there's another problem. There still aren't any jobs waiting for them when they're finished. Somebody's going to have to bring some type of industry in here to help it. That's precisely what local officials have been trying to do for the past year, says Robbie Matisic, Director of Economic Development for Greene County. It takes a broad and very focused initiative. A lot of resource agencies, a lot of people, a lot of businesses need to want to do this. So I, th I think we're on a good path toward that, but it's not something that happens overnight. Although some miners have gotten jobs in construction or long-haul truck driving, Matisic would prefer to see them trained for higher-level jobs in technology, healthcare, and manufacturing. The right thing to do is to diversify. All economists know that. And now Greene County has an opportunity too also. It's painful. It's a painful opportunity. But it's nevertheless an opportunity. While many people here wish the coal industry could just recover, most acknowledge those jobs aren't coming back. And this community, supported for so many years by coal, will probably never look the same again. And as those changes happen, Inside Energy will be there to report on it all. Thanks to our partners at the Allegheny Front for their help on this project, and thank you for joining us.